Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Very good. Watch yourself. It's summer. It is. Where are you based? I'm in Boston and it's almost 100 degrees today. And so we had some pieces of our of our house have issues. So I rapidly <laughs> just moved a bunch of hardware around to make a makeshift office <laughs> elsewhere. At, what is 100 degrees Fahrenheit in real temperature? Is that like uh, 40? Approaching that, yeah. It's like 97 yeah. degrees, I think, today in humid. Hmm. So. I think the folks from the OpenSMO are not alone. Meeting. How can you tell if they're in the wrong meeting? Uh, they just told, uh, they typed on the uh, Slack. I'm on the Zoom meeting and I'm all alone. I will uh, send the Zoom meeting link to, or if somebody wants to get, get to it before I get there, to send the link to the channel. Mm -hmm. I think we just took the wrong exit. Yeah, I'm not sure where this old meeting link seems to come from. I think it might be. But in any event, um, so uh, let's get started. We are, uh, this is a CNCF meeting, the code of conduct applies. Um, we say that at the beginning of every meeting um, and we will continue to. Uh, so uh, please abide by it. Uh, I put a link to the meeting doc in the chat. Uh, please sign in. Uh, it looks like we have some things on the agenda uh, already. Um, on the on on the on the issue of Zoom and all of that, we're about to move off of the Zoom platform onto the new platform that the CNCF has stood up, um, the community sites. Uh, we've just gotten the YouTube stuff working yesterday, uh, and I've posted the last two meetings to YouTube there. Now that we've sorted uh, how to access it and whatnot, uh, and moving forward, we would expect to be using the new site versus Zoom. So hopefully, some of this this um, uh, some of these issues stop being uh, an issue. Um, with that, uh, do we want to just get into the agenda? I got word that uh, both Richie and Bartek are both uh, uh, otherwise indisposed. Uh, there's a number of conferences around observability uh, going on this week, and I believe they're both they're both speaking or both helping with that. So. Um, all right, uh, so I guess who has the MH9? Uh, the first it's item. Me. <laughs> cool. It's still me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, with, with, without further ado, uh, uh, handing over to Kit and, and uh, Ian, uh, in case you missed it, uh, there's a really cool effort around standardizing uh, the formalization of um, SLOs. And uh, the two folks here are the experts. They've got a talk to us about it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for letting us crash your party for a little bit. And sorry for being late. We got confused in the Zoom link, but we figured it out. So uh, I'm going to I want to walk you through Ian and I together. We have uh, a few slides we want to share with you. We're going to both present. And then Ian, of course, has a working demo that he's going to show. So that will be your payoff for paying attention to our presentation. Um, yeah, so all right, cool. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah, so just by way of introduction, I'll just introduce myself and then I'll let Ian introduce himself in a second here. So I'm Kit Merker. I'm the COO at a company called Noble Nine, and we make a, um, basically an SLO platform, error budget and SLO platform as a commercial product. And we use some of the um, tech that we built to create the open SLO uh, project along with some other folks. Um, we'll get into that in just a second. And my background, I was a product manager on the Kubernetes project in the early days. Um, so I worked on a lot of the ecosystem and developer uh, environment there, worked on GCR, stuff like that at, at Google, and then worked, been working on developer tools for a super long time. And then Ian, 
Yeah, I'm Ian Bartholomew, uh, SRE lead at Noble9 here. I've uh, been doing SRE and uh, DevOps at a few different companies, most recently at uh, Sweetgreen and now at Noble9. I've uh, been, been doing a lot of work here with the open uh, slow work. All right, so what is it? Okay, the, the, the basic idea behind open SLO is there's a lot of buzz and discussion about SLOs in the market, and there's a lot that's come from Google's work and, and other you know, companies that have adopted SLOs internally, whether that's Netflix or Facebook or you know, GitLab or Lyft or Uber, or like all these companies that have built uh, SLO tooling internally. And one of the interesting capabilities that we're uh, focused on, and Ian will show you how this works, is really about um, declarative, uh, you know, uh, code, right? Declarative YAML, if you will, or, or some language, if we want to be uh, leaving YAML aside for a second, it's implementation detail, but the concept of being able to check it into source, to be able to unit test your SLOs, um, to be able to make that part of your CICD GitOps workflow. And then further, the reason why we care about having open standards is because it allows you to be vendor agnostic. It allows you to, as an end user, to, um, you know, to choose uh, how, who you want to have the engine powering your SLOs, even if um, that changes over time and makes it easier for, for them. So for us, it, we want to make sure that this concept of SLOs is uh, spread far and wide. Of course, we've, you know, we have a commercial motivation to have people choose our back end, but having the open SLO format means choice, it means collaboration. And when we started asking people about this, um, and uh, Ian will talk a little bit more about the motivation, but we found companies like GitLab, right, where they had built an internal um, SLO language and you know they wanted to have something that would be easier uh, to get collaboration to get feedback and also for hiring purposes that you know if this became a standard um, you know they'd be able to find people for that and Dynatrace with the uh, captain project had their own SLO uh, YAML format as well and so they've they've joined the project and then Niall Murphy who is uh, you know uh, notorious uh, SRE who's you know was one of the original authors worked at Google and worked at Microsoft and now he's out, struck out on his own and he's contributing um, as well so Ian, you want to talk a little bit about the, the motivation? Yeah, so like one of the primary motivations that we had is we wanted to create like that common framework uh, to express the SLOs um, in part because we have a common language. We have that lingua franca that we can kind of all share and understand so that, you know, if I go and work on this product, I have an understanding of how to express those SLOs or if I go over to this company, I can then uh, work with their SLOs there. Um, the other part with this is, you know, as we're all trying to uh, approach this problem space of, you know, how do we define and express these SLOs in code, and then also express them to users and dashboards and different types of users, uh, we want to establish best practices, we want to establish kind of a framework of how, how do we do that, how do we accomplish this, and how do we solve these problems, because everyone's kind of coming at this from, you know, different uh, angles different needs different requirements um you know everyone's looking at the elephant on the different sides um so you know how do we come together and uh, uh have that uh, uh you know rising tide raise all the boats um and then like as kit talked about being able to have a skill set that's transferable so that i you know for hiring purposes or you know as a developer being able to go to companies and say like this is this is something that i know i can i can have um, um uh, an impact earlier uh, in, in my career there. Um, and the other part of it is to uh, uh, be able to promote SLOs um, and drive the adoption. Uh, Kit actually has had a blog post about this, talking about breaking the build and capping, putting SLOs into the pipeline in order to uh, kind of force the shift left. Um, and then I don't know if you want to talk more about that. Well, I think... I, I... I think the, the key thing here is I think of it just like like unit tests. If you think like pre uh, the early days of trying to tell people like you should have unit tests like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, uh, and you, like, you go around and yell at people. And I think that's kind of like the place, the state of the art for SLOs right now is you, teams will go around team by team and say, hey, you should have SLOs. And I think if we can make it part of that dev workflow and make it part of the, you know, just like when the unit test started to break in, in a CACD pipeline, you, you would be motivated to add unit test to protect yourself. And I think the SLOs as code concept kind of gives you that same power. And uh, and that's when, when marketing talks about shift left, I think this is what they actually mean is getting that feedback loop in build breaks earlier in the in the process. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do with the Oslo, and we'll, we'll get into that, but that, that, that tool set, uh, being able to drive that uh, kind of SLO as code in, in CI CD 
pipelines and enforce that. Um, and then also, as like Kit talked about, we talked, we heard uh, uh, about and kind of had an anecdotal awareness of other people kind of doing this. And so we wanted to kind of bring everyone together to, um, uh, uh, you know, bring all the bring all of their knowledge, experience, needs, requirements together um, to, to help drive this adoption. Uh, and then being able, and then finally just having less vendor lock in. Um, you know, if as a, as, a, as a company, a lot of the times you have that fear of getting that vendor lock in. Uh, we wanted to be able to have a way of people not having that to have, remove that one barrier for adoption, and um, and so again, further driving adoption of SLOs industry wide. And that that's a good transition to the kind of the the buzz, and we're getting we're getting a bit of early buzz on this. So I think we have maybe we've just crossed a hundred uh, open slow Slack members. Um, and you know, people on the, <laughs> we even got the attention of the analysts, right? We got Gartner and IDC talking to people about, uh, open SLO, um, and talking to end customers. There, there's a video here that from slow comp with IDC talking to, uh, Adobe Stripe and then bull.com and Skibstead, uh, which is a, I guess a media company. Um, it was, so it's early days, but you know, we we already have quite a few stargazers and PRs coming in. I even got Brendan Burns even filed an issue. So, you know, we're, uh, we're on the map, uh, and people who joined the interesting thing is like, we talked to people ahead of time and we, we kind of found people doing this ahead of time. But since we launched the project, we've had people coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, Hey, uh, we were thinking about this, or I was about to start a project or something like that. And, and they're kind of, kind of coming together. So that's a really exciting thing. Um, but without further ado, I think Ian wants to give a demo. I think that's what, but while he's yes. Sorry, on no, up the screen, any questions or comments, I'm going to stop sharing any, any questions. All right. So far so good. Okay. Yes. All Here right. we go. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, this sounds great. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm go for it. Take it away. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so first, I'm, I want to demo just the spec, um, what what that is, and then uh, the the tool Oslo, and then you know just to give you uh, help your mental mind uh, mind map of this. We have the spec, which is a written spec, kind of think like GraphQL, or it's or it's a, it's a written spec, and then there's different implementations um, that use that spec. Um, uh, here we have, we have openslow.com. Um, links to our GitHub repo here, where we have the op open slow spec itself. Um, and here we, we talk, we have, we talk about um, what, what it is, what type of objects we have in the, in the YAML, how that can get defined. Um, right now, you know, again, it's just a markdown file, but again, we, we go through and we define like what, what the expected type is, what the stanzas are, what the objects are, how that works, we're, we're, you know, um, there's a lot here. I encourage everyone to go check it out. Um, and again, there's been a lot of, like, like Kit talked about, there's been a lot of interest in here. So there's, again, uh, uh, just in like the last like month, maybe since we announced this, if, if it, it, I've, I've lost track of time. I think but, it's, yeah, we, we announced it on May 18th. Yeah, so less than a month, we've had a number of people contributing, saying, you know, how would I use this if I'm required to use this in this case? You know, what about that? So, you know, again, this is a very much a living document, and people are uh, really engaged on this. Um, on the other side of it, we have Oslo, um, which is the command line tool that uses that spec to, like, right now, validate the YAML files that you provide to it. Um, it's just a Go Cobra project. Um, but I'm going to run through what it looks like to validate those files um, right over here. Um, so uh, right now we have it as a um, release, and so you can just pull down the binary for um, yeah, whatever distro you're using, uh, platform. Uh, just going to run through installing this right now, so I'm pulling down that, going to untar that, just to show you guys from beginning to end, what that looks like, showing you. All right, so we have the README, uh, everything. And then we have the Oslo binary. I'm going to move that to somewhere in my path. Not showing you my password. And now, there we go. There's our little help file. 
clear that up. Um, I'm going to pull down our repo because it has a number of like test files. Um, so you can see what a, a kind of expected like service, uh, which is one of the objects that we define, and then what an SLO looks like and validating those in both like passing and failing scenarios. Um, go into the directory. And so we, here's the number of files that we have in there uh, for testing purposes. Um, so first I want to show you what, uh, what a valid service looks like. A service is kind of, it's a logical kind of grouping of SLOs. So it's very minimal. Basically right now, according to the spec, it just defines kind of a name. Um, and then if we want to validate that, we just pass that file into the Oslo validate. Uh, uh, oh my God, I don't, <laughs> anyways, uh, pass that to Oslo validate. And uh, right now this is a valid one. Um, so taking a look what an invalid service looks like, you can see here we have our API version, uh, which is foo, which is an invalid uh, API version. Uh, so we want to validate that. So we're going to pass that to validate. And we get our, an error back. It also returns a, um, uh, a exit code appropriate to that too. So it works in CI and CD. Um, it won't just pass without uh, breaking or it will not, not pass without breaking. Um, SLOs are a little bit more um, involved. There's a little bit more to it. You can see we, we now have um, objectives. We have a ratio metric. This is a rich ratio metric type SLO. So uh, we wanna be able to validate that. So gonna again, pass that to our validate. By the way, Ian, I hate yeah. to interrupt your flow here, but your query, uh, somebody pointed out to me that I showed this demo to and you're, your uh, good and total queries are the same. There should yeah. be a where, there should be a where clause on your good. But that's actually that's a good act, yeah actually I should check check that should I was be thinking like a check it should be that. a validation rule right because if yeah. you're good and good and total are the same then that SLO is sort of invalid. But I I'll I'll, I'll follow an issue right now. That's a good idea. Yeah I that, see see that that's the magic at work right there. Um, so here again passing and it's valid. Um. I love the display name. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, <laughs> you got to have fun where you where you can. Um, here's a threshold based um, SLO showing you what that that looks like. Uh, where now we have it in the indicator block. We define our threshold metric there, uh, whereas uh, with a ratio we would define that in our objectives block. Um, so here we're going to validate that. There we go, valid. Um, so I want to now break this and show you what a breaking scenario looks like. So you, here you can see we have our budget method, which is occurrences. We're gonna change that. Um, I'm gonna change that to something that will break. I'm gonna change that to foo. There we go. Show you, in fact, that, um, that changed so that there's nothing up my sleeve. And we get back an error and an, again, an appropriate exit code. Um, gonna change that back. Yeah, so there you can see nothing up my sleeve, validate that again and it's valid. Um, so that's Oslo in a nutshell, um, uh, right now, again, very nascent. Uh, there's a lot, um, we want to add to that. Well, uh, a lot of things, you know, a lot of ideas that we have to have, like kind of beef up, um, enforcing SLOs in a CI CD context. Um, is there any questions? I know I might, might've just gone fast on that, but is there any questions on that? Just an observation, more or less, that is, it, this lends itself really well to GitOps, right? You could imagine yeah. having that in there and having a bot that uses Oslo, whatever, um, underlying library, or whatever, to say like, hey, you know, you made a mistake here, or this is invalid or whatever, and um, gives it back to, to the developer to fix before they can actually move on. Yeah, exactly. That's the... Um that's the primary use case that we're trying to envision on this. Um, 
I, we want to beef up that validation and not just do static analysis on it, but we be able to do kind of more dynamic analysis too, which is kind of like a, the, maybe the next step from what Kit was just talking about, being able to then put in more guardrails for people being like, you know, this type of query would produce this type of outcome. You don't necessarily want that or something like that, uh, based again, on, on the needs that people are talking about and the experiences that people are bringing to the table. Well, another, and another thing I think, which uh, Ian and I have talked about is also doing things like presence checks and doing warnings instead of errors. It could be useful too. So if you imagine you're trying to drive SLO adoption in your team and you don't necessarily want to just go start randomly breaking everybody's build, you know, this is sort of like, we're like going back to my unit test analogy, it's sort of like test driven development, right? It's like, Hey, let's just make everything fail. And then, you know, the goal is to like clean up all the tests that they pass, which is not necessarily, um, you know, we can debate the merits of that, but to me, it's not the most uh, friendly way to do it. I think the the idea here, you'd be able to say, okay, we want to start encouraging people to notice that they have build warnings that are, hey, you don't have an SLO defined. And then the build warning sends you to a helpful, you know, article about how to generate your first SLO or a template you can use. And then you check that in and then the warnings eventually can become more, um, more rigid over time. Uh, and, and do enforcement so you don't kind of um, move backwards. But those are all kinds of, I mean, I know, and I'd love to hear more use cases for this too. I mean, there's been some interesting discussion about like, how should SLIs be defined? Can we make it so that there's a, you know, an SLI specification? Can we do things like, you know, not necessarily have it in YAML or have different uh, file formats because different people have different uh, allergic reactions to different structures of data. There's a, there's a lot of room, I think, for, um, for uh, uh, collaboration here and a lot of, room to kind of experiment. I do have one more slide I wanted to share. I forgot to kind of present before we wrapped up though, um, specifically around governance, because a CNCF presentation would not could be complete without some sort of discussion of governance and contribution. So I wanted to make sure we, we covered that. Uh, and then, we, you know, if there's more questions we can take them, but basically um, we want to invite people to contribute, right? Uh, but we want to. We're we're just in the very early stages. We we threw this project out there because we thought it was something people needed, and we had talked to these other folks. And so there's like this small core contributor group, uh, you know, five-ish people. You know, it's Noble Nine, uh, GitLab, Dynatrace, and Nile uh, are really what we consider kind of the core group. They're the ones that you know chopped the wood and carried the water to get started. And um, we haven't decided exactly where we take it. But if this project gets traction, and I mean real traction, like you know, getting stars on GitHub is, you know, it's cute and whatever, but it's not real traction, right? When people start actually saying, yep, I'm going to use this and adopt it. I actually was talking to an SRE yesterday who is working on making um, SLOs work for some synthetics, and he's thinking about taking his little app and contributing it. There's there's a bunch of stuff sort of happening where this could turn into something real, and then we'll consider our options. I think, you know, we, we love the CNCF. I used to be a board member in the C or a governing board member of the CNCF. I helped launch the CNCF in the early days. Um, we also think Apache could be a good place for us. CD, CDF could be a good place for us. There's lots of different kinds of um, places for it to go. We don't want to jump the gun because we know that also, while it adds some, some good credibility, it also adds some overhead. And uh, we want to just make sure we, um, we think through that. And we're, we're very open to feedback there too. And so um, we're trying to be you know, as transparent as we can. But as, as some people have said, you know, it's, it, it's not good enough to just say, we're trying to be transparent and open and whatever, you have to actually demonstrate it. And so we'll take those steps in an appropriate way. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments on kind of how we're thinking about governance or if you have any advice for us, you know, I'd, I'd definitely appreciate that. Awesome. Oh, so you, after you, Michael. No, I was just saying that, that that sounds sensible to me. That makes a lot of sense, yes. Okay, thanks, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I would, um, this, this, this looks really cool. Um, my brain is spinning in a couple of different directions. Um, one early piece of feedback I had is I love the approach of using Kubernetes native objects. Um, I've been reading up on Crossplane and investigating that. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. uh, and there's some of the techniques that are enabled by doing this, such as, you know, if you had a Terraform shop, they could use the Terraform provider, you know, and then because this is a native Kubernetes object, it's just automatically working. Um, there's also some, I don't want to say API machinery because that's a moniker, but but there's some, there's some collateral in the, in that project as well around um, validating um, validating hooks and, and other composability features like compositions and other things where you could easily see um, folks assembling a platform that is inclusive of SLO definitions and, and, and all of that. Um, one other question I had to follow on is, has any thought or work been done around automatically generating SLOs? There are some 
other projects um, that were linked in tag observability that I'm, <laughs> I have on my short list for Friday to play with to automatically generate SLOs from existing data, right? So I'm kind of curious, like, if 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 any work stream is there to ease the UX of generating these initially, uh, so that it's not you know death by YAML, or if there's some other visualization or um, way to kind of see this a, a report or or something. Yeah, like yeah, good. All all great questions. So one one of the places where uh, that the the capabilities you're talking about is what bleeds over to kind of the commercial product side of what Noble9 does, okay? So we, you know, and I don't want to pollute the uh, open source discussion with it, but basically like what we consider kind of the proprietary capabilities are things like the fact that we can ingest uh, data from multiple data sources you already have, right? We take Prometheus and Datadog and, and all those, we have like, you know, 10 different data sources. So no, no re-instrumenting. So yeah, let, do, let's keep the scope to the open yeah. source stuff first. Yeah. So, so in, the, in the context of the open source, the I was just kind of saying is the stuff that we consider kind of the proprietary. I was just trying to give you a sense of that. But the, the SLO generation, the visualization, the data ingest, we're kind of treating that as proprietary pieces of tech right now. Over time, we'll, we'll see what happens. There may be some innovation there, or some 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 gradient uh, on ramp. Uh, so there's no plan as of right now to do those things. I can see people coming in and contributing different ways to do that. Or another way to think about this is you could use a proprietary tool that, you know, observability or noble nine or whatever to generate um, the slow uh, YAML, which is what we do in our products. We generate the, the SLO definition. And then if that's open SLO compatible, that might be one way. And then it will give you a, a bridge um, from one to the other. But I don't know if yeah, that, 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 that's so, fair. And, and I'm sorry if I opened up a can of worms. No, no, it's all right. Um, but, but yeah, so just keeping the data definitions makes a lot of sense. The last thing I would just say in response to your question around ecosystem and whatnot is this, the TOC. Uh, has recently uh, provided some updates to the sandbox process. Okay. And just to re reiterate that one of the expectations in sandbox is you have a lot of projects that might merge or 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 collaborate, or they might be solving the same problems in different directions. Um, uh, and so I would just, yeah, uh, just as a blanket statement, I encourage you to check out the new the new sandbox process. Yeah, it's, it's a bit it's, more it's, streamlined. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, but I'm sure you're aware. Well, yeah, and, and uh, we haven't totally grokked the updates yet, but that is a good a good reminder to go look at. I think uh, I think the main from talking to the people who are contributing to the project, I think the main thing right now is trying to just get the bootstrap of like these sort of very basic capabilities and process some of these pull requests and, and things like that. And uh, and then I think as a set, step two, once that gets to a kind of a certain level of of you know feeling good about the the tech, then I think we'll start exploring the um, the governance piece a little bit more. So that's awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, lastly, if folks want to play immediately, I know you had some links earlier. Um, will you be sharing these slides? Uh, yeah, I will go ahead and make these slides uh, public, you know, publicly viewable, and I will link them in the um, in the tag. And I actually went back while we were doing this, and I added a video here as well, which has the demo video, which is linked on the Open Slow homepage. But just so you can you can watch that again. But uh, Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can basically go and download. An, an Oslo and just go and there's some sam there's a um, sample mm -hmm. going here. There's actually the sample. Um, where are they? Uh, in test. In test. Yeah. So in here, yeah. there's actually passing and failing example uh, doc uh, slow YAMLs. And then so if you go in here, like you can see the ones that he was using in the, the demo. So everything's there. Um, and then the definition is back in the open slow, open slow. So all the definitional stuff that here on that on that. So yeah, you can literally go start playing with it right now. Cool. Yeah, it, it looks like a lot of work's been done to codify the uh, the, the data model and whatnot. Um, does anyone else have any other questions uh, uh, for our guests today? I was kind of wondering how you're seeing like given that we're like in cncf space um like how how do you think it can um integrate with already existing cncf projects right like prometheus open telemetry um i don't know fluent d or whatever you have um kind of like already uh, existing um are there any plans or is it like kind of, kind of orthogonal and, and evolving throughout the time going forward uh i would say that uh, there, uh, there's not necessarily concrete plans, I would say, at this point. I think there's been some discussion. I mean, definitely in the Prometheus uh, Thanos side, I think there's a very logical connection there. I know there's already been some work done to do 
uh, SLOs and Prometheus and some different projects. I can't remember the name of the, the but you know what I'm talking about. There's like that, uh, that tool that generates uh, SLOs. And um, I think there's a very logical connection between SLOs and Envoy or other service meshes. I think this is really, um, you kind of think about like, so you have this sort of telemetry where you're collecting metrics and some of that can be generated by uh, kind of the service mesh. Then you would have SLOs that you'd want to tune. I think there's an opportunity for open source projects to publish their SLOs, right? If you think of like, I have a service and there's a set of SLIs and there's a set of SLOs that will go with it. And um, having a common uh, uh, endpoint that you could say, okay, I have this service and I reference that, that, that endpoint on that service and it, I can ingest an SLI stream and then I can apply my own SLO on top of it and define what's important for my usage of that service, right? I think those are some, you know, some interesting possible possibilities, um, but definitely we'll need help in kind of socializing that and, and seeing if it can uh, make sense uh, in those cases. I actually think there's there's also SLO based auto scaling that could be a really amazing use case. So you think about like so what some of the SLO use cases, right? We've talked a bit about the GitOps side because that's what we have in Oslo, but the use cases around um, progressive release and uh, and rollbacks. So I think like feature flagging, canary releases, blue greens, rolling updates, all of that stuff driven by SLOs so that you can um, see if the, the updated change is actually having an impact. SLO based auto scaling, which is a more uh, elegant kind of way of doing auto scaling than, um, than uh, CPU based or resource based, which is CPU based is great in some contexts, but if you're trying to manage it to user expectation, you can model the SLO. So I saw a demo yesterday from this developer, I don't know if you guys know Bargov from Tailwinds, but he built uh, a uh, uh, basically an auto scale, node and pod auto scaler that can accept SLO based signals and then use that to either scale up the pods uh, from a replication controller or scale up the nodes um, and can also do like load eviction. And the idea is that you can tune then the error budgets, right? And then it's, it's so there, I think there's some interesting auto scaling Capabilities could be useful in the cloud as well, um, but uh, anyway, those are some, like those are some of the use cases I think are super interesting. For sure, this is not something. Th this this project cannot live alone. Like it, it's kind of useless, right? It's a, it's cute. Like hey, I have a YAML file that's validated, but if it, it really to have value, it's getting that um, the the semantic definition of SLOs to work with these other data sources and and uh, compute platforms, things like that. Yeah. Perfect answer. Yeah, exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. So. There you go. PR as well, I think that. is the answer, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I was like working on the um, SLOs for Kubernetes and Prometheus, like in um, intersecting those. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity kind of like in the open source ecosystem there to make it work. I like, would definitely, definitely appreciate your help on, on figuring out the right people to go chat with about that too. And I, I know Ian would. Yeah, yep. for sure. All right. Anything else or we'll get out of your hair and let you guys finish your meeting? Uh, no, our, our meeting exists to have stuff like this be the topic of discussion. You're not putting this out at all. This is up the center line. Uh, you know, the, the tag, the technical advisory group exists for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but the charter is quite broad. And a major part of that charter is identifying gaps in the ecosystem, identifying new projects that may opt to join the CNCF umbrella. So uh, thank you for uh, coming to, to to share uh, the project with us. And um, I know that uh, I've received a lot of inquiries as well, and I've had to stave them all off and say, I don't know what I don't know yet. So uh, thank you again. Awesome. We really appreciate you guys having us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please stick around. We've got uh, some some stuff coming up. Um, all right, we'll, so, we'll stay out. Cool. Yeah, let's, uh, let's walk through the rest of this really quickly. So next is, um, uh, is um, around collaboration and, and starting, so, so we had identified a work stream to facilitate uh, in-person meetups once the pandemic passes as it will, we have to trust, um, and people start meeting up again. Uh, so I think this is a follow-on discussion. Uh, is here, he's not here today, so I guess we could skip it. Oh, hey, Mike, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you're here, you're here, I'm so sorry. Um, no I was way. scrolling through. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, so, Matt, actually, I just wanted to uh, discuss a pro proper framework for events and meetups. And, uh, you know, you had a bunch of suggestions regarding interviews and all of that, right? So, I just figured uh, if we have a proper framework or something like that, that we can uh, use to create events and all of that part, right? 
on multiple platforms. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a Twitter handle going ahead. There's, there will probably be a LinkedIn group or something, right? For tag observability as such. So uh, I just wanted to uh, check in, get everyone's views on uh, how we can uh, have a proper framework, right? Uh, either we can have it on a single document or we can have a GitHub issue template, whatever works for everyone. And uh, secondly, uh, I mean, uh, with com uh, with the community engagement part and everything, right? Uh, it, it might also be a good idea for us to nominate some people, like two, three people, to uh, a, a sort of communications team or a communication sub team within the working group, right? like uh, the way working group GitOps has done this, right? They have uh, a two, three person volunteer team. Uh, obviously, everyone is welcome to pitch in. Everyone is uh, welcome to collaborate, but. Uh, uh, they are probably the ones to you know get in touch with uh, while organizing a meetup or something like that. So uh, just wanted to get everyone's views on that. Um, yeah, so I linked in a GitHub issue that um, has been there for a little while. Um, uh, we're, we're we're just now putting in place some of the stuff so that we can manage things in in parallel. Um, uh, I'll get to it at the end here, uh, but. But yeah, put put your thoughts on that issue. I think the the, the way that we conceive uh, tags running and what, the way other others do is they generate working groups that are time bounded, uh, have artifacts as an output, typically a recommendation uh, or uh, you know some 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 conclusion, uh, you know, and they and they're scoped uh, as such. So I would propose that we make a working group, as I said, to to cover these issues and come up with. Um, a solution accelerator, if you will, of sorts, you know, that, yeah, that sure. is to, to launch this. Regarding some of your comments around Zoom uh, and and timing outs and Zoom limits, uh, I believe uh, as we engage with the new CNCF uh, platform for, for meetings, uh, as well as events, uh, some of that should be mitigated or ameliorated. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's gonna be baby, uh, but uh, uh, Matt, please correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, from what I understand, CF, CNCF is also providing all the tags with uh, their own YouTube playlists and all of that, right? Their yes, I'll, 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 be, I'll be covering some of that at the very at the very tail end. Um, sure. But yes, we have a YouTube space uh, there. Once we have a logo, we need a logo before we can have this weirdly, uh, but there's actually a, a CNCF landing uh, zone for, for a tag. Uh, we'll get stickers, which is yeah. what I'm very excited for because I'm that way. Um, uh, but a, a bunch of other uh, stuff like that uh, should become accessible to us. Uh, so. Uh, so I think uh, let's just come back to that later once you uh, once we are done with all, all the other items, right? Sure, sure. And, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, let's see, we're at, we're at 40 minutes. Uh, so K, uh, XK6 distributed tracing. There was a demo and somebody- That's did. me. Super. Take it away. So yeah, let me show. Also, also on the previous one, I didn't mean to shut you down early. Um, I, I think we'll get there for sure. Um, let me try to share. Can you see something? I hope. Okay, so I don't have a lot of slides, but I added the slides here, so you can click here if you want to see them. So yeah, hi, that's my introduction. My name is Daniel. I'm a security engineer at k6.io. Welcome. And yeah, hi, <laughs> it's my first time here. And also I'm a maintainer of Grafana 10. So I'm here to do a small proof of concept of xk 6 instrument tracing. And first I would like to introduce like what's k6, right? Because maybe you're wondering that. And k6 is an open source last testing tool uh, the cool thing is that it lets you create your tests as JavaScript. Uh, the tool by itself is pretty in Go. Uh, it, uh, as I said, you can write everything as code. Uh, it supports multiple protocols, HTTP, gRPC. Also, it supports like creating metrics inside the tool and exporting them to a wide array of backends. Um, yeah, you can see on the right how a basic test looks like. Uh, we have a, a test with some stages with different virtual users, different durations, and we are doing some get requests and checking that the status was 200. Uh, the thing is that 
Earlier this year, Key6 developers added support for Key6 extensions, and this means that you can extend Key6 with Go code. Um, the plugin system is very easy to, to like to, to use and to extend, and there are like some extensions already available from Chaos Engineering extensions to Docker, Kubernetes, crypto, multiple extensions for different things. Um, yeah, the community is, is liking it, so yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, today I'm here to talk about one extension that I developed with a college as a proof of concept for adding open telemetry instrumentation on the HTTP path of, of, of K6. And that means that you can use K6 to run your load test, your integration test, your whatever test. Um, um, you can track like the request, right? The full path with, with distributed tracing. Um, I'm going to use this small thing during the demo. Uh, it has like two services instrumented with open telemetry. It has one collector, Tempo, and Grafana. Everything runs on Docker Compose. So if you want to play with it locally, you can. Um, yeah. First, I would like to run just a key six test, like on this on this setup, and we can see how a trace looks like. And then we will do the same with the with the key six plus the extension. So for the first one, <coughs> this is the test that I, I want to run. As you can see, it's, 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 it's very simple. It has five virtual users. It's going to run for 10 seconds. We are going to do like an HTTP GET request. And we are going to check that the status is 200 and that it returns full bar, right, on the body. I'm going to run this script with k6 run. I already have k6 installed. So yeah, this is example.js and it's running. Uh, at the end, k6 is going to output like a, a small summary with all the metrics and stuff, but we won't use it right now. Um, yeah, it finishes. And now we want to like to, to find that trace, right? From the from the full service. The thing with Grafana Tempo is that if you want to find that trace, you have to know the trace ID. There is like no way to index the traces or anything like that yet. So what I'm doing is on the on the full service, I'm logging it each request. Um so we can pick some trace ID um, and see the trace. So I want to copy this. And as you can see, we have all the logs from the full service. I'm going to pick one. Let's say this one. Let's go to Grafana. Um, yeah, you can see the trace, nothing fancy. Just two, two services doing some HTTP requests. So yeah. This is how it looks like with plain key six, and maybe you're thinking, okay, that's nice. I can generate some traffic on my app, or yeah. But we wanted to, to have this, this, this ability to track these requests from the load generator, because for example, if you're doing synthetic monitoring or cause engineering or load testing or whatever, it can be interesting to understand how a specific request in some point in time affected the rest of the system. So with this extension, you can do that. How you can use the extension? Uh, the, the instructions are quite easy. You have first to download like XK6. XK6 is a small helper to create a K6 binary with all the extensions that you want. Once you have XK6, you can just run XK6 build and the extension. Uh, so we are going to do just that. I already have XK6 installed locally, so I will just build the new binary with the extension that I want. Building. Okay, that's ready. You can see that well, now, now I have like a, a new binary, a new key six binary. Um, once we have that, we have to modify this test, right? Because we have an extension with some new functionality to key six, and we have to change some things. Um, not a lot, but yeah, some things. First, what I'm doing, I'm importing the extension because we need some tooling into the script for, for this to work. Then I'm instantiating a new HTTP client instead of using the default for K6. This client is instrumented. Um, I can pick the exporter, propagator, and endpoint that I want. Um, then I can, if I want, interact with the trace ID. Uh, we return trace ID on the response object, so you can play with it as you want. You can log it, for example, if the request matches some status or whatever, you can play with it. And then we have this at the end as a, some kind of life 
life cycle thing of key six just to shut down the instrumentation gracefully so we don't lose traces or anything like that so as you can see i'm using the otlp a grpc if i remember correctly exporter and we are using the w3c propagator and we are going to run this new test um let's see what happens so let's do this sample as you can see, we are logging the trace IDs. Um, yeah, now we don't have to go to the full service to, to find the, the traces. We can see them here. Um, I can piece just one, one trace, one trace ID. I'm going to Rafana, paste it. And as you can see, I'm going to see the full experience from the load generator. Uh, there are some spans that are for, generated by key six around the HTTP connection. Um, I have a full trace for, for like for the full request. Uh, it's kind of flexible. We use open telemetry, so we have support for a wide variety of propagators and exporters. Um, maybe you don't need to export the data that K6 is generating. Maybe you only care about being able to start the trace on K6, and you can do that. There is a noob exporter, and that means that if we use the noob exporter, uh, key six won't export the, the spans the, that were generated from key six, but we get the trace ID, so we can play with it. We can still correlate each request, right, with uh, with what happened on the backend. Um, yeah, this is like the repo. I have links at the at the beginning of the presentation, and as I said, this is like some kind of proof of concept. Um, I'm sure that it has more use cases than generating some fake traffic on a demo <laughs> and doing some examples, but yeah, just happy to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks. Oh, thank you. It's amazing. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, we're using K6 quite heavily uh, in my day job uh, happily. So uh, we have some folks that are interested um, uh, that I'll be pointing uh, your way. Uh, that are you know, we're using open telemetry as well, and we've rolled out tracing and um, uh, and and merging our load test and uh, in infra with, with this looks exciting. So awesome. Before we move on, does anyone else have additional comments or questions? Yeah, I wonder about the performance impact of the K six. Actually, how is the memory print? Can you also be talk about that one? Uh, K6 or K6 plus the extension? Yeah, K6. K6. Maybe I'm not the best person to answer this. I don't ah. work. I mean, okay. <laughs> I, I don't work on the K6 open source team, but uh, I would say that it's kind of lightweight. We're using Goja because K6 is written in Go and we spawn like Goja interpreters for JavaScript uh, in memory. And from what I understand, it's kind of lightweight. Uh, a lot, uh, but yeah, probably I'm not the best one to, to answer that question, so. Okay, thank you. Can you point us to someone or is there, like, where would we Ooh, get yeah. more? We don't <laughs> probably, have to do it here. You can you can put it on, on Slack in the in the, in the tech channel. Yeah. We don't need to do it. Update the here. meeting notes with links as well. That's sort of- Or in the meeting notes, yeah, awesome, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will left, leave some links there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you uh, for having me. Oh, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Uh, oh, no, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much and welcome. Uh, we hope to see you in the future, uh, but don't be shy. Um, is Arthur here? I'm guessing this next one is for him. Uh, yes, I'm in you. Uh, I was not the one that put it that uh, in the show. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? Bartek did this. Um, on the observability <laughs> white paper, um, is there anything you want to speak to or should we take it offline? Um, I know there was some discussion around the app delivery, um, or rather the security white paper uh, that came out of the app delivery team, I think. I can't remember the specifics, but uh, a week ago, um, uh, there's a white paper that they've done on GitHub uh, in another tag. and and. I had spoken to some folks there and they found keeping thing, you know, once they moved from Google Doc to uh, a series of markdowns, they found it easier to fan out and, and have review 
uh, and, and whatnot. I don't know though if that's a process y'all want to do. do. Did you want to speak to that? I know Simone's out for a while, right? I so think, I think the, the most pressing issue is that we we would love to have a you know every other week where we have not a, a you know entire the entire team meeting uh, for this working group for the the observability white people working group to to meet right. So if we could use this 50 minutes or whatever every other week, like next week, for example, to get a progress there, where under the, the chairman, chairpersonship of, of Arthur and Simone, we, we get that done and, and have a progress there and, you know, can really get that out of the door. That was essentially the main, the main motivation behind that, that comment okay. that Bartek left there. Cool. I think that will also be covered in my last little blurb, <laughs> uh, because there's some, there's some machinery uh, for working groups that are also, um, that, that we get for free. Uh, so I would say at a high level, um, working groups, you know, once formed are free to meet however, wherever they like. Um, we can make playlists in our new YouTube channel for working groups. So just like we have meetings that have support for, you know, archiving them to YouTube and, and whatnot, uh, uh, working groups can use that as well. And, and it's the expectation that we build out uh, playlists. Uh, earlier, someone had talked about a communication uh, thing. I think what, what a communication body within a working group, that's certainly fine. I think for tag observability, um, I should have things documented for the next for the next meeting we have around some specific proposals uh, around that. But uh, yeah, we have this new facility with YouTube uh, between Twitter, social, you know, social media of all kinds like LinkedIn and uh, uh, Twitter and the rest. Um, you know, we could really use contributions from folks that have experience uh, running media outreach or social media stuff, or, uh, you know, just defining a program that there's all sorts of things we could do. You know, we, you know, we, we had discussed previously things like uh, interviewing, you know, some of the folks that came before us, right? Software engineering and, and cloud native is, is also new, but we're now a multi-generational discipline and we weren't before. We have multiple generations of engineers working, right? So there's industry-wide, there's a knowledge transfer uh, that needs to happen. So, you know, perhaps the tag could do things like interview the folks that made Telegraph and StatsD and Collecti and, and some of the things that came before the tools we have now to interview them and ask them questions like, you know, back in the 90s or 2000s when this stuff was designed or earlier, you know, what couldn't you do because there wasn't enough compute or memory or, or whatever? Um, what, you know, what insights might you have now that we do have these capabilities? So we could do like interesting interview series like that. We could do deep dives. We could do lightning talks. You know, we can really, we were instructed uh, by Amy and, and the TOC to really be creative with our YouTube presence. So there's a huge opportunity for us to do effectively whatever we think makes sense and, and would be awesome. Uh, so but as, re as it regards the working groups, I think meeting on the off meeting off weeks is great if that time works. But again, that's up to the folks working on it. Um, you know, uh, but when you do decide, we can have those working group meetings be in the CNCF events page. They can be in our space. They can be in our YouTube stuff. You know, all of the meeting support that's all there for working groups to self organize. Uh, and however, however they see fit. Hey, Matt, uh, I'm sorry to interject, but. Um... Just on the topic of YouTube, I, we run a slightly successful YouTube channel and uh, some of the stuff that's worked really well, I just wanted to share. Shorter videos are always better, like always better. And one of the things we've done, um, like when we did the slow conf videos, we, we did this thing called the buddy system where we assigned two people to each work on each talk. And it may be one of the single greatest innovations of my entire career, to be honest, because normally um, chasing down videos uh, and doing it ahead of time is like one of the worst things you could possibly imagine. We had 70% of our videos submitted on time and requiring zero editing for slow comp, which is just an insane thing. And it all, I credit basically the buddy system for the whole thing because it created social accountability, it created uh, ownership, it gave people an audience, it gave them a person to impress uh, and sage feedback on their talks and they got that in exchange. So it just really changed uh, the, the game. So I was just something to think about and giving people constraints really helps them um, get creative. So if you say, okay, we're gonna say it's only, you know, it has to be about this topic, it has to be this this length of time, it has to have a clear takeaway or whatever it is that you create as rules will drive that that creativity. And then the other thing we've done a lot is interviews that have show and tells. Um, we didn't do it for slow and comp, but when I interview people, I ask them to do, hey, do you have something you can show and tell with me? I did one as an example with Matt Moore from the K-Native Project where 
he basically just showed me a bug and it was like maybe like one of the most interesting conversations I ever had with somebody about about a bug and uh, we published it to YouTube and you know got a bunch of hits and there's there's some other examples like that too. So That's great. A couple um, of I, yeah, uh, I, I I gave you a call out in the doc. If you want to provide some details so that we can follow up on it, um, we should absolutely talk some more. Uh, it sounds like you might have some ideas uh, for launching our YouTube presence or or at least contributing to it. Um, Right. So that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we have like three minutes left here. So, uh, but that's great. Let's follow up on it. Um, and, and if you're around on uh, next meeting, we could, we could talk at more length on the topic. Um, I've, I've taken, uh, so there's a new GitHub project I've put up. It's just a simple Kanban board sort of, I would expect that if we are planning for our success, we're going to have a lot of contributors, right. Um, and there's a lot of things to happen in parallel. So this meeting, that we're in now, I would expect would so, seem more like the TOC meetings where working groups are reporting out on status. We could do like a quick stand up style, you know, 15, 20 minutes on any blocking issues and just report outs uh, and then leave the, 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 the latter portion for an interesting guest, a topic, something that requires more. But, but as we scale up, we're going to need to, you know, just manage it accordingly with work happening asynchronously and in parallel. So this is not an exhaustive list, but I've, I've seeded uh, that new board with some ideas that we've talked about over the last few weeks. Uh, I would encourage anyone, if you're interested in these things, add yourself to the issue. Um, I think I would, rather than sort of saying like, this is our process, I wanted to throw it out there and say, what do you all think of a lightweight Kanban um, so that we could manage the life cycle of these, of these working groups and they can have clear defined ownership. Um, and there's lots of best practices uh, that we can we, we can use that other tags are using as well. Uh, and there's some chatter uh, on that as well. But what do folks think about the general approach? Um, and lastly, I wanted to augment a third project with an, I, I can't come up with a better name, but I, I have one at work, we call it the idea pipeline. And it's sort of like no idea too big, too small. It's just a way to get started. Oftentimes the barrier to, to starting on a project or starting on an idea is just literally starting. Uh, so, you know, having a, a low friction way to just get ideas out there. Like I would like to be able to visualize network traffic with Linker D using a HoloLens too. I think it would be cool. So I'll go put that idea there and folks might wanna make a project around it or a demonstrator or, or whatever. Um, I think. Uh, Matt, quick follow up uh, around the working group idea. Uh, do we have a specific template to propose a working group or something like that? I'm so happy you asked. Uh, there is actually an issue for that. It's the first one there, that issue number nine, uh, to have exactly a template that has those things um, so that when you make a new issue on a particular board, it pops up a really low friction way to do that. The key things about a working group are uh, they should have ideally more than one chair or leader. Um, they have a, a time bounded uh, period and then they have outputs that are, that are, you know, so just basic project management type stuff. But yeah, please, yeah. please see there. And then, yeah, um, see it GitHub would love to hear thoughts, but uh, yeah, we don't have time to walk through all of this, but just to, to give you an idea, these are some of the things we've talked about. Most of these are actionable almost immediately. Uh, so if folks wanna dive in, uh, feel free, uh, propose new working groups. Again, um, the purpose of this technical advisory group is, is to be an open way to uh, work on stuff like this uh, with our colleagues. Well, for now, uh, since we don't have the templates, we can speak with you on Slack on GitHub to set up, like, for example, the white paper working group. I'm sorry, what? So since we don't have a template, for now, uh, do we stick with you? Oh, the, you know, I, I, I took the issue that we were using to track the white paper and I just put it into in progress because because you create oh. any kind of process at all. So again, um, I'm hoping that over the next few weeks uh, in some of the issues that I've linked here, uh, most notably issue number nine, uh, we could kind of come up with what that is formally. Um, we're about out of time now. Um, I did want to leave you all with one parting thought, at least that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks, and that's how can humans best perceive reconciliatory feedback loops from systems theory or control theory. 
uh, you know, feedback loops are at the heart of GitOps, at the heart of Kubernetes, the controller pattern, operator patterns, all of this stuff. Uh, and so as these systems become increasingly complex, uh, we're going to need ways to, to think about, you know, how do these things aggregate? How do they compare with each other? How do we reason on them? How do we visualize them? Um, you know, we're doing it now with metrics and things like that, and that's fine. But I have to believe in the universe of human computer interaction uh, research over the last 40 years, there has, you know, the way humans grok these these reconciler uh, patterns uh, that are stacked up and, and nested, if you will, and, and, and have interplays uh, uh, is going to be increasingly relevant. So I've reached out to some folks at the GitOps working group about this, um, but it's just a general thing in the back of my head for the last couple of weeks. So if anyone has ideas, I'll see you online uh, or in the next meeting. Uh, is there anything else that folks want to mention before we're I don't know if we get cut off, but we're, we're technically at plus 30 seconds, so. Uh, apologies. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, one more thing. So I was reading up on the observability white paper and uh, do you guys think it make it makes any sense for us to have a like sort of a skeletal document basically on the concept of explain it to me like I'm five year old kind of thing. Do you think it makes any sense to do that? What do you mean with skeletal? to do what? Uh, so basically, like the, uh, a skeletal document of the observability white paper. So I mean, it contains the a brief introduction, or um, I mean, things in a simpler language, or things like that, to help people understand it better. Uh, I would definitely take it up with Arthur. Oh, sorry, I'll let you speak, Arthur. I think the white paper is already already aims for a, a, a simple language. So if anything is not very clear, I think we need to uh, fix that instead of creating a new paper. Okay. Uh, and and if you know what parts are more complex than it should be. Uh, no, no. Common, uh, Arthur, what I mean by that is like uh, uh, white papers are generally supposed to, you know, include a lot of concepts and uh, they're supposed to include definitions and everything around that, right? Like they, they're supposed to include a lot of data and everything around uh, all concepts. What I'm trying to would, say is, uh, would it, uh, I'm sorry. I, I would not necessarily have that discussion out of your eyes. We, we, we have a couple of folks who are invested amongst others, Simone and others um, who really like, I, I remember Richie bringing up something similar like that the last time we met. Um, and I think it would really make sense if we, you know, don't, don't rush that discussion in, in two or three minutes and then we have to hop off, but really have a proper discussion around that. And if you put it in, into the, the Google Docs, that would really help what, what you exactly mean with, you know, your skeletal or whatever you, you had in mind. But I, I know for sure that there are a couple of folks who have um, input and, and ideas around that as well. So I would suggest not to necessarily discuss it right now. That makes sure. sense. Yes, indeed. And, and thank you for the feedback. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, I think we need to close the meeting here. We're at plus three. So um, thank you, everyone who stayed to the blood, to the bitter end. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll see you next time. And um, I think next time, if I'll just throw, throw out there, there's a lot of new faces. Um, in two weeks, I'd love to just open the meeting with, uh, we haven't done it in a while, a round of intros, just so that we can all know each other and who we are. But thank you again for joining and have a wonderful week. Thank you all. See you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.